All right. Happy Tuesday, everybody, and welcome to another Future Focused, where we are exploring the landscape of business, technology, and human experience with the goal of keeping you 10 steps ahead. Today, I'm looking forward to this conversation like I look forward to every conversation, but this one is going to be a fun one. We're going to be talking about AI for content creation and we're going to dig into some of the things like text to video, text to, you know, what AI avatars are capable of and how to use this, which if you followed my stuff for long, you know, I talk about this from all different angles, but this one in particular, we're going to be talking about it from a very positive lens of like, where can this practically be used? Because yes, you hear about the nefarious purposes and some of the bad things you can do with it. And I feel like sometimes a lot of times that overshadows the really practical, helpful ways that we can use these advancements and technologies to make experiences better, make people's lives easier, um, and overall improve experiences for end users. So to navigate that conversation with me, I'm joined by Alec Upen Uspensky. There we go. I almost missed it. Um, Alec Uspensky, who is the founder of Eli. And uh, yeah, so thanks so much, Alex, for joining me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to chat. Yeah, no, we're, I'm looking forward to it. And it's it's so funny because we were talking backstage about this. So <laughs> you were in Canada, you are in Spain now, you're from Ukraine, you, you've, you've had quite a journey. So I actually am curious on this, given that, you know, geographical diversity of your background, how did you end up getting into what let's see what what do you say like the the ai video generation space like how did you end up deciding hey i'm going to build a company that's focused on ai for video generation um yeah like um fr from i think even when i was in school i i was into like engineering and like you know creating stuff so i okay. I, I, I um graded as software engineer so my okay. background is is really technical so for me, okay. so you like, at least had you had kind of that technical acumen getting started where you knew you were going to do something with tech. Yeah, 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 definitely. And uh, AI is just like, you know, more advanced tech and something that's even cooler that you can do. So I basically or organically come to this. Yes. Yeah? So I started with like just okay. simple apps, then something more advanced, more. And then uh, I think maybe seven years ago five years ago i came into like ai and specifically like machine learning what this technology can do and like basically it, it can up that through all the all their lives last five years i would say i'm into like ai and machine learning okay okay got it so yeah okay because like sometimes some some of the guests i have they're like they started in film and they were doing this and then you're like and then you started an ai company so it's always interesting to hear you took a not traditional but you took a more predictable i think journey in terms of that yeah now i'm i'm sure you've seen a lot because going back to what you said so you were going down this technical path and really the advancements we've seen in artificial intelligence have really accelerated i think largely i mean they've been accelerating for a long time but a lot of folks think like this might be a 2022 thing, but it really hasn't. I mean, machine learning really took off. Deep learning took off in 2017 is really when it started going. And as we saw it advance. So when you first were getting into AI and stuff, where did you think that would go? And where did you have any things where you thought this is the direction I'm going to go? And you pivoted because I'm guessing, I mean, I think back to 2017, AI for create video creation that wasn't really on the map at that yeah, point. Yeah. It, it wasn't, it's true. I think uh, the first time when I like started to do something with machine learning, it was like, you know, pretty, it, it was not that fun at that time, you know, it just was some tables and like you, it's basically about data and like, you know, turning one data into other data, some predictions <laughs> that was something more advanced but again it was like okay pretty yeah, ai wasn't super fun and sexy yeah, like it is now where you're like oh wow i can just type in a few words and come up with this really beautiful image you're like no exactly. you were taking massive amounts of data and like you said predicting conclusions yeah. on other massive amounts of data it's it it was it was not fun uh until like <laughs> it started to be 
uh, related to computer vision, like when the pictures, something to do with pictures and uh, um, working and like transforming pictures. Of course, I think the boom and everything changed, like started to change maybe a couple years ago or three yeah. years ago. As generative AI, as the GPTs exactly. really started coming together, that's, I think, when not only did we see mainstream adoption, but we started to see some of this just more advanced yeah. capability that people started going, whoa, we can do some crazy stuff with this. Yeah, I think it's it's basically a couple of things. Uh, first one is actually the generating of videos, images, like from any scene or like getting the picture there close to, you know, what's uh, uh, some... Uh, masters can do yeah and uh yeah also the for me the the crazy thing was when i first checked uh, uh chat gpt 3.5 uh, so okay. basically it's one of the first uh large language models that are actually could help people and like it feels like you really have a conversation so because i i i uh, checked open ai products before and it was like okay this is just give me the another portion of text and like it was not not that fun but as soon as yeah. they changed the model that it really started to help people and like to answer your questions to understand you that changed everything so now like we have this boom of uh, large language models and i think this is like the biggest thing that came up in in ai for the last year okay. yeah it um it's been interesting to watch this over the past few years really evolve. And in some ways, um, in some ways, it's been a huge leap forward. In some ways, I chuckle. I had a guest on, I think, a few weeks, and we were laughing about the fact. And for some folks who watch or listen to this, you won't relate to it because you weren't a nerd like I was. But like in some ways, it reminds me of back in the early 90s, some of like the text-based text RPGs, you know, where... We've, we've kind of like gone back in time where it's like, oh, and now I like type in my command and then it does a thing. And then I type in my other command and it does a thing. So in some ways we've really jumped forward. And in some ways we've actually gone back to some of the basics of actually a really natural and intuitive way for us to communicate, which I think is, you know, we see in text messaging, we see in a lot of other ways. It's very normal for us to communicate uh, through that kind of language based communication. Okay. Yeah. So then, so then as that advanced, where did the, Hey, we could use this for generating video. Where did that come into play? Um, for me, um, I, I just tell a bit, a bit my experience, I think. So okay. how can I, could I come up to this? So I actually have, have, uh, another business, which is like basically a software uh, development uh, company so i founded it eight okay. years ago it was basically what one of my first uh, uh, business and it's still uh, growing the company but i'm not operational into it and at some state i just like uh, quitted it as, as a ceo as an operational manager it was four years ago okay. and uh, and at the time i was like okay i want to build something super techy super cool <laughs> and of course i looked into ai space so okay. um i really dive so i had some time uh, to really spend it on research and like understanding what's going on in the ai space and i saw this technology of basically turning um turning audio into somebody lip syncing and like basically it calls lip sync when person is yep. saying that's based on the audio and i i really fell in love with that and i thought it's like super cool idea it was three more than three years ago uh, but i already <laughs> saw that it's a future so now we all see lots of ai avatars but at this time i just saw that it's something i mean if you think about cool. it though at its time and it's so funny we say three years ago like that was so long ago but in the ai <laughs> exactly. age three years is like a century in some ways, yeah. but it is interesting because I do remember when that technology first started where you could basically dub, you know, in a different, and it was really used for translation stuff largely, you know, it was kind of solving that translation problem of, well, we want a video of somebody else saying things in a different language, but we don't want the kind of, you know, I think of like old Kung Fu movies where you're, you're watching it in English and 
you're like, that's not, it doesn't <laughs> fit, but it was this kind of early, like, Hey, how do we morph the video using text so that it actually matches? So that, that was kind of your Genesis of like, Hey, if we can do this, we could go further. Exactly. Uh, it, it's technically you change the leaps and you don't need this text and this video to, 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 to have it before, right? So how yep. avatars are working right now is basically the same. You got the video and you change what person is saying on the video. So technically okay. it's the same, but it feels like you all the time has new video, yeah? Of course, okay. technology is evolving a lot, and now it, it allows to not only like change the lip syncing, but also change the whole video, like the whole body yeah. of the avatar. But back there, like even the lip sync, uh, it was like already something that's changing how people okay. create the videos uh, overall. Well, and I guess when you think about it like that, it is one of those things where when you start unpacking some of these technical capabilities, some of the same foundations remain the same. Because to your point, a lip syncing video is really AI generated video. It's just, you've got basically the base frame and then you're like, well, we need the face to move different. So we'll use AI to transform that. To go beyond just the lips isn't really that big of a leap anymore. You're like, well, we just need to change the, the background or where the person's sitting or what the person looks like. We can put a different mask on it and make it do the same things. Yeah, it, it depends on the use case. I think as as we as we went really into like the specific use case of creating like learning content, uh, I think the first. So we actually during these three years we tried different different use cases. So and we just came up that specifically for this one, this type of videos work best specifically for like creating learning content. And we also focus on the technologies that are fit to, to this use case. So if you're talking about, for example, some fun apps when you put mask on your face uh, yeah. or like other fun things that you can do in apps, then the different use case and then a different AI technologies can be used. So it, I think now it really depends on the use case and like it's lots of lots of different professions, use cases, uh, problems that need to be solved in a different way. And uh, it could be solved, but really different AI technologies and AI yeah. approaches or without AI even. So it depends. Well, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting about this, and I, and I want to dig deeper into some of like the capabilities that are behind this, because we're going to talk about like voice cloning and, you know, the AI avatars. But really, when you think about what AI has done, I think sometimes when I hear the fear and some of the concern around this, it can sometimes come from this idea that this is brand new stuff that's never been done before. But when I really think about what's going on here, we've been doing this kind of stuff for a long time. It's just AI is making it much more scalable than it was. I mean, I think about, you think about big movie productions, it's not new to you know, put a CGI mask on somebody and change the way they look, you know, and I mean, if anybody who's watched some of this stuff on behind the scenes of videos, like we've been changing yeah. the way people look in video, changing the way they sound. And I mean, this isn't brand new, but I think what we're talking about with what AI has done is it's made it a lot simpler because you used to need a whole production cast to have to do this and a whole team of like editors to edit video to be able to do this and what ai is doing is it's actually just making it much easier is that yeah. is that a reasonable conclusion yeah yeah i agree so it's the technology itself is not like grabbing anybody's jobs it's more about like these small pieces that new new things that new software can do it just helping in a different different scenarios to speed up things to make things simpler makes things uh, cheaper to produce uh, as you mentioned in movies itself uh, lots of i see lots of ai startups or like new ai technologies that change in the movies for example uh, uh, another company from ukraine called respeachers what they do is that they are not doing the uh, voice from the text but they actually changing the voice so in the movie okay. you need like specific accent and specific phrases to be set in specific time uh, but they, for example, create voice of like Darth Vader or somebody else. 
uh, instead of like so they have a actor that is speaking his voice and artificially they change its voice into something else so yeah it's lots of different things that just helping to make things better and you have in the end you have better movie better uh, content and uh, you your life is just easier whatever you do well and i think about some of the i mean anybody who's and i think this is just something if somebody has not been involved in video production <laughs> if you haven't been involved in it you don't fully appreciate how much like non-glamorous robotic stuff is being done that's like the people hate i mean i just i've been involved on yeah. the back end of video production and there's like a lot of stuff where you're like god grief we got to take do number take like 37 because somebody screwed up the like one word type of a thing and we got to go through the whole thing again and it it sucks like it's not a fun thing and so i think sometimes we immediately gravitate towards this oh well we're going to create things that are new and like it's it's a threat versus looking at the landscape of things that we do today that we go this is work a lot of people hate doing but now going back to my example of rather than taking the 37th take like you said we do one take and we can go hey if we need to make some edits or tweaks or you screwed up a word, we can just kind of edit it in form instead of saying, all right, everybody, sorry, you're not going to get to ho go home to your families tonight because we got to do five more takes of this thing because uh, we screwed it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just uh, in, in many cases, it's just make people's lives easy and they have better and fun jobs, whatever they do. And in the end, of course, when I watch this movie, I have the better quality. So I when i see something i i'm not aware of like how many technology affected this movie and like uh, like if you've seen like doom the second part yeah or like something else i'm pretty sure there are lots of ai in when when they produce it lots of new things because and when you compare these movies and movies that was like 20 years ago of course you see the difference how how oh, things yeah. are changing and like how much better things are right now and it's much yeah. easier to create it now than before. Of course, uh, I mean, in terms of like this small things, yeah, like small, that repeatable stuff or something else. Okay. So, so I want to talk about some of the specific capabilities just to help people understand how some of this stuff works. So let's break these down based on kind of a couple different components that I know, you know, you've specialized in, but I think it's capabilities. That it's just good for people to understand. So let's talk about like the voice cloning component first like that's let's let's break that down in terms of so when you say voice cloning what does that mean like how do you describe that to somebody yeah so voice cloning is uh, basically a text-to-speech technology but uh, why we say cloning is because it's a, a, the model is able to provide this voice in in your specific voice so uh, how it works is just uh, basically we have a model that has a uh, text as an input and give the audio of this text uh, as an output and but you can tune it uh, with your own voice so basically you just uh, if you if somebody is familiar with 11 labs you just need like 30 minutes of your voice uh, to record into the system into their model and then you have your own voice so you basically record your voice then you put any text and the system is is basically providing the your own voice in like so just from 30 seconds of your voice so it's like ability to replicate your voice and like use it uh, from just text you don't need to record yourself each time okay now from an accuracy standpoint i'm curious your take on how this has evolved because i've been playing around with this stuff even it's so funny how mainstream this stuff has come you know where it used to be you used to again you'd have to have a whole production team trying to do this because if you if you actually look into this even in movies and it was sometimes controversial like if an actor passed away i can't remember what movie it was but they actually did some ai voice cloning to help finish some of the lines that didn't get done so that they could finish the movie because it was like well what are you gonna do you can't just change somebody's voice three quarters through the movie everybody's gonna pick it up um but like it used to take massive amounts of efforts to actually be able to clone. And I'm curious, two things. One, how much 
data does it actually require to train your algorithms to actually be able to clone? Like, let's say we wanted to capture my voice and clone it. How much voice do you need for me to do that? And then how accurate is it in terms of, you know, being able to some of the nuances or the tonal differences or the way certain people express themselves? Because I, I think sometimes when I've heard people respond to this, they're like, oh, yeah, I've heard AI voice before. And you can definitely tell it's a robot. And so I'm curious your take on how you're you're approaching that one. Yeah, it's it's actually changed a lot during the last couple of years. So even like two years ago, we didn't have such a quality as we have right now. So before, like when we started to work on Eli, I think you always could feel that this voice is robotic. So it just started to be like, okay, more natural and sounds like much, much better. But now not you cannot say like we did the research and basically people are not able to define where is like so i as i used to these voices for a long of time then i can i can in some cases i can okay. say okay this is like text to speech it is like voice so is it kind of in some ways i have i have a clone of my voice and i I've, I've toyed around with it but i'm curious your take on this cuz you're around it a lot more do you see it kind of being like what happened with chat GPT where when chat GPT first came out, like lots of people were using it to create written content. And then over time, people could kind of tell, like, I can kind of tell that it's written by chat GPT. Like it has a little bit of an artificial flavor to it that you can detect. Are you, would you say that like you're close enough to it that you can still kind of sense like I think this might be artificial sweetener, but it's not so obvious that just anybody would pick up on it. I think it depends on the duration a lot. So the the voice okay. itself, for example, your voice clone could sound really like you, but when when you listen to a podcast versus like text to speech voice clone voice for like long time, you see the difference because. What is really like is emotions. So when you have a text to speech, it's always not that emotional as the real your voice. Because when you speak, you have a like you have poses, you have lots of different uh, emotions, and yeah. that text to speech is not that emotional. But anyway, it's changing, and pretty sure, like in in a year or two, even like uh, your voice. But again, maybe you need to record more of your voice to create your voice clone uh, to be it more emotional. But I'm I'm pretty sure at some stage people won't see the difference. Okay. Okay. Well, and I feel like we'll we'll just kind of again, similar to some of the generative AI stuff, people will I just read an article this the other day that said uh, that it was like a couple words that have just exploded since the advancement of generative AI because now people are creating so much generative AI content and certain words that we just never used in the English language before all of a sudden are everywhere because it's like, well, AI's using it. So I wonder if we'll start to see some of that. But again, text to voice, you're not having AI come up with the script necessarily. So even going back to our earlier point, there's still a human in the loop on that because what is being generated, I mean, I guess in theory, you could ask ChatGPT to write the script and then have the script be read by an AI voice. Yeah, and then the whole thing is just AI. Case, yeah. But it's, then, then, it's, then it is going to sound robotic because it's going to be like, well, that's not how a human talks. Yeah, it's 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 actually a case like when people try to like uh, use more of generative AI on different stages. So on like text stage, on voice stage, on avatar stage. Uh, but still, uh, it depends on on what you want to achieve, of course. But in our case, like what we do is actually we help people to generate text or like modify text using ChatGPT, for example. But we okay. always have human in the loop. So on any stage, when you create video with Eli, you still see like how it works. And it's always require human to change stuff. Yeah, because whatever okay. generative AI is like doing, it's not human. Yeah, and it's not might be not something that you want to have. So we always have human who is basically changing things before the final video is ready. And I think it's it's gonna be working like that for for a long long time because human humans are not replaceable. They are they have something that machine cannot do yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and so I am curious because you did hit on one of these things, and I do think this is a legitimate 
kind of eyebrow raise that I do see around like the voice to text. And we'll get to the video piece next, but let's focus on the voice to text for now. You know, we're talking about cloning. So taking somebody's voice print and basically creating a replicate of it that you could then type text and it would sound like that person speaking it. How do you necess- how do you safeguard some of that so that, you know, you're you're keeping people's identities and I think this is one of the things that we're going to have to navigate even just from a regulatory standpoint in the future where like how do you not have somebody end up misrepresenting somebody by capturing their voice and then using it without necessarily their consent it's 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 a good question and um, I think it's a task for the companies like us um, like those who actually are able to create such technologies and of course for governments for everybody um it's it's i think that the the way how we can handle it is the same as like something else before yeah like when people started to use internet on where people started to use like credit cards it's like you cannot steal a credit card of somebody and use it right so the same is here like if it's illegal then we for example are not allowing to like uh, voice uh, clone or like clone avatar uh, without the permission and um, if somebody is coming out to us and say can i make a video avatar of like tom cruise or somebody else we we cannot allow it (laughs) okay well and that's where i was curious from a process standpoint because i'm thinking about my voice clone i remember i had to go a fair through a fair amount of steps kind of authorizing authorizing the use of that voice for it to make a clone of it type of a thing. And there was a fair amount of kind of security measures in place to make sure I wasn't just grabbing a sound clip off the internet and going like, Hey, can you make the voice of so-and-so type of a thing and add it to my library? Yeah. For for example, you might face that, that you need to say in your voice, like that you are proving to, to make this uh, voice to be cloned. So the, the same for us, we see the, the person who is like talking to us and like uh, what exactly the avatar look like because we create avatars from videos. So uh, it's, it's all measurable. Of course, you can also automate stuff. For, so for example, you know, there are models that can check if the voice photo or footage is like from some famous people uh, and it also can be checked. So. It's lots of things that that you can use, uh, and uh, people and companies will use to to protect. So, um, my vision is that, like, it's not it's it's gonna be regulated as anything else in in our world. Like, of course, uh, there are gonna be some uh, misuse of the technology, For sure. as it was the misuse of previous technologies. But the the pattern is the same. Um, some people. And most of people and technology itself will evolve and will do the good things in, in most cases. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a good point to bring up in this, because sometimes when I hear the concerns about these things, there's, I mean, they're legitimate concerns and I understand them and I agree that there are risks we need to mitigate. But I think sometimes we can operate off this kind of false pretense that it wasn't possible before and now it is. And it's like, well, it was possible before, so it's not like these risks didn't exist and now we've created new risks. There's just new and different ways that those risks can be applied. But as you brought that back, because for anybody watching and listening, who's going like, well, how do we, you know, how do you know your voice isn't just being cloned type of a thing? I remember actually, I remember when I cloned my voice, I actually had to, and it was unexpected. Like you gave it the audio clip and then it asked you, I need you right now to record saying this is so-and-so and I authorize this. And then the AI validated that yeah. is the person who's authorizing this, the same voice that we're now adding to the clone. And there was some detection even in that to make sure that I wasn't using an AI voice clip to say, yes, I authorize yeah, this exactly. whole thing. And so like I, it actually had to come from my microphone type of a thing. So there are definitely some security measures in place to make sure you're not. So anybody who's listening to this thinking like, hey, great, we could have Morgan Freeman narrate all of our (laughs) e-learning it's not going to work you're you're not going to be able to go grab like your favorite celebrity and yeah uh, yeah it's 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 the same like when for example when you put a video on youtube it checks what music you use right it checks uh, anything that's uh, 
like even without AI, yeah, you, you cannot just like use somebody else to to use in in your stuff. It's it's the same here. Like it's it's you don't you don't even need to change the rules, right? Because you can use Morgan no. Freeman uh, videos and identity in any ways, yeah, in your content. So it's just like different ways of content, different types of content, but still the rules are the same. You can do this, and you you couldn't do it before. No, no, yeah, it's not it's not opening a floodgate of stuff that was just you know exactly. previously impossible type of thing. But I do I know I get that question sometimes. We're like, well, aren't you worried that these kinds of things could happen? It's like I mean, technically, if somebody is really trying to be nefarious they're going to try and figure out ways around it. And that's a risk that's true at all times. Just like you said, like people can hijack your credit card today. It's not like yeah. it didn't exist before, but I think there are parameters in place. So that's super helpful for the voice cloning in terms of what you can do. And I want to talk through some of the use cases, but let's talk about the video. Cause I'm guessing it's following a similar process where, you know, you're using just like you're using a voice print to kind of capture the voice, you're also probably using a video to then capture the video. Now, how much kind of data do you need on that to be able to create a video clone of somebody? Yeah, so it's it's pretty much the same. Um, we need, uh, in our case, we need two minutes of the video footage when a person is like- uh, It only takes two minutes of video footage to exactly, capture yeah, that? Not, not, not much, yeah. We just need to actually see how your lips are moving according to, to the voice, according to the audio. And it gives the model ability to then basically use these uh, movements to other audio. And that is that is how it works. So we need two minutes and then uh, you just say how you usually say, uh, how you want your avatar to look like. So for example, like how you want to move your uh, head, head and uh, hands and everything. And then your avatar will, will behave the same. So, so in uh, terms of capturing, I mean, to me, it's it's always interesting on these. So to capture the video piece, now when you're capturing video stuff, is it, you know, are you, do you need enough of a video clip to kind of see like the dimensions of somebody's head so that if they turn and things like that, it looks, you know, or is it just, because I've seen on your stuff, like you can literally from a selfie video create yeah, a video clone of yourself. It depends on the, the technology. So for now, uh, most of the companies, they don't change the uh, video itself. So if you move like this, your avatar also will move like this. So basically on the footage and on the avatar, it has the same movement. So we don't need to, okay. to have your uh, your this look if you, if, you, if you don't film that, yeah? Typically but, do that. Uh, okay. And uh, now uh, we are turning into like the next level of technologies where basically you're gonna have your 3D model of your, model. of your full body or like chest up body then yeah like okay. of course the uh, we, we will require a bit more of the footage so we see clearly like your all the parts of your face and then basically but it gives much more opportunities then you can actually um avatar can not only like speak but also can do anything like if you want avatar to blink or like to move some face gestures it's all gonna be possible so okay. i think Next level of avatars are all like fully customizable in terms of like what they can do on the scene. I mean, this, this I what's funny is every Friday I do a weekly update. Um, so for for anybody who doesn't listen to this, I, I don't do them on live on LinkedIn, um, but I publish a podcast where I kind of hit on some of the latest happenings and just kind of reflect on some of these things and AI influencers. It's kind of a big thing now where it's like, well, now the technology, it's still not quite there, but it's getting there where, you know, a lot of the AI generated video you see with a clone, it's like this. It's more of a talking head. You know, the person's kind of moving a little bit, but it's a little more static. And it's now getting to this point where, you know, it can, you can take the person's full 3D body clone and you can put them in a car and make it seem like they're sitting in their car doing this other stuff. And it's kind of bonkers because the rise of AI influencers, and I'm not talking about people who talk about AI, but people who are just, you know, not trying real, to sell so. you AG one or whatever, you know, from their, from their living room, you start to go, wait a minute, is this even like a real person sitting in their car doing this anymore? Or is this a person that actually 
it is a real person, but it's completely artificially generated. It even couldn't be a real person. Like we see lots of uh, examples. Well, that's true. There, there is fully uh, AI generated person that's never existed before. So it's all going to happen. And we definitely going to see lots of content that we are not sure, like if it's real or not. Like, for example, OpenAI Sora technology that can produce like 10 seconds clips that really looks like reality. Uh, and what I think uh, it's going to happen is like basically YouTube will put the page on all AI generated videos like it's AI generated. And so all the um, YouTube... they've already started doing it. They've already started ah, okay. doing it. So because I, I'm I a YouTube see. creator, I get to see this stuff. The thing is right now, it's it's kind of like the honor system. So when you put content on YouTube. And it's actually buried down in the like advanced notes. Like there's like a, did you use any of this check yes or no type of a thing? But I think okay. to your point, it's going to get to the place where it's just going to be able to detect it. And it's going to say like, no, it, it either is or it isn't. And it's going to automatically flag it. Just like if you upload a video to YouTube with a song, a famous song, and you just yeah. layer it in, it'll flag your content and go, sorry, you can't do that. Yeah, definitely. It's lots of companies. And I think YouTube definitely working on this, like on basically a detector of AI usage. The same as like, for example, if you use ChatGPT to like create SEO content, uh, Google is already like detecting all such kind of content. So basically, uh, all it's going to be detectable. I mean, it, it's all algorithms. So basically, other algorithms can can see if AI was used. Even like we humans, we might not notice that, but uh, YouTube will be able to do it. <laughs> yeah, and, and it is funny because um, I was talking about this, I don't know if it was a couple of weeks ago, but we were talking about this where AI has one, when it creates something, it has a very distinct pattern in how it does it. That again, to a human, we might not even be able to detect it. I mean, sometimes you can, like if the person says, you know, this uses some of these obscure words, you're like, I don't think you actually yeah, it's, it's, said that. Cases, but yeah. then there's other ones that are much more subtle. But to your point, the AI algorithms are getting to a point where they can start to detect like, that's not actually, that wasn't actually created by a real person. That was completely artificially generated, which like what we're talking about in this content generation where it starts to get a little messy is when it's like, well, it is AI, but it's made in partnership with a person. So where do we draw that line of, was it truly artificially generated or yeah. like how much of it is actually artificial then? I think, I think if you use just a little bit, it will already, it will already be like marked as AI. Yeah. Because of course, you can just modify existing video or like you can modify just one second of, of the video. So <coughs> I don't know, we'll see, but uh, I think it's it's it somehow will be regulated. Somehow people will see if it's AI or not, or even like we're gonna feel it like when people when it's gonna be much more of such content, we're gonna feel it because when people is like they also learn from the content they watch. Yeah. So the more and more, for example, we're going to see like ads with AI people, AI generated ads or like personalized ads. Yeah. It's of course we will understand that it's AI because this ad was created specifically for me with my name. On it, <laughs> yeah. <example>. yeah. So. <laughs> it literally said my name in the ad. There's no way that they actually went exactly. and filmed and the whole ad. I think also for brands, for they, they don't really need to, I think we are just going to get used to AI content and content creators won't need to hide that it's made by AI. Why not? Like if it works, if the content is working, if it's made by AI, so who cares? Like, I mean, what is the disadvantage? So most people will look content, whatever it is AI or not. If they like it, they watch it. If they don't like it, they don't watch it. I agree. And I think this is where, you know, and this is where we'll get to some of the positive use cases for this, because I think we are in this weird kind of awkward stage <laughs> where... <laughs> Everybody's like using artificial intelligence for stuff, a lot of this gen AI stuff for stuff, but it's also kind of taboo to say that you're using generative AI for stuff. And like people have mixed emotions about how they feel about it. 
and all this. And to your point, I think we're going to get to a point where people go, I don't really care. I just care. Did it resonate with me or not? And some folks are going to really resonate towards certain things and others are going to go, no. And I think there are just different use cases, which is why I think it's important for us to kind of unpack the use case around learning and educational content, because I think there is a lot of opportunity for AI generated content where ultimately it's not the it's not the avatar, it's not the voice, it's not the background that is actually making the content valuable. It's what's in the content that makes it valuable. And what this really can do is then eliminate a lot of that kind of operational stuff that really slows the process down. Yeah, and it's, it's not only uh, the time, it's also about the quality of content. Because, for example, I am like expert in some topic, yeah? What I can do, yep. I can write an article, yeah. So my audience would need to sit and read for 10 minutes for like to learn something from me. And with, with new technologies like AI avatars, AI voices, this I can just turn my knowledge into like something more engaging, much more fun. And this is exactly yeah. what we do. So we change in how people can create learning content, which works much better. So Specifically, Eli is focusing on like learning inside enterprises, inside companies. And before yep. they used lots of like PPTX presentations, texts and super boring like learning materials, which people hated to read, hated to learn from. I have no idea what you're talking about. I have never experienced that. Everything I've always experienced in corporate learning is always rich and engaging and, <laughs> and so, so, so much fun. You, you, you then, you, you, it, it's, it might be a really lucky, lucky company <laughs> and something exceptional. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, because, but I think to yeah. your point, I, th what, I think to your face, point on that, oh, go for it. Go for it. Uh, yeah. What we face is really like people using a lie that turn really like boring PPTX long files with like 50 slides into the videos. That's, that's now their employees can watch and like understand and like spend much less time on 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 the learning things okay well and, and i think you know to your point on that because i even think about um the work that can go into so i think anybody can probably recognize or be familiar with this kind of incident or maybe this is you um where you may have a lot of really good knowledge about something that you do, or you may be really well versed in how something works and you may know what that is, but the number of people who aren't necessarily the best at being able to get it out of their head. And even if they can get it out of their head to your example, maybe they can dump it into a PowerPoint. We've all been subject to that thing where that person is then now going through their PowerPoint with you and you'd probably rather listen to nails on a chalkboard because it's just the person does not have the skill set to actually engage and present and connect yeah. the dots between some of these things. And it's not that they're not smart or they don't have the value. It's just, that's not their skill set is their ability to translate this. And in the past, to your point, that's where you end up with the, the Franken power deck. That's like, okay, what do we do with this? And then heaven forbid, you're like, Hey, Judy or bill, can you present this to an audience and Judy or Bill is not a skilled presenter and now they've got a Frank and, and it's just, it's honestly a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's really common use case. So in, in that we have a, basically a person who is like making the topic and he, he knows how to like, he knows he's, he's expert in some topic, but he's not the narrator. He's not able to like present and, pack it into like good learning content. So uh, before there was other people who were specifically into like packing his knowledge into something that people can learn. And now we have to do it automatically and on speed up things. So for example, now we can turn like the big amount of text and knowledge of some person. So we can even like turn his uh, speech into the text then we can unpack and like make the beautiful slides with avatar from this uh, text and then turn it into the video even like with questions so for example now this expert can tell something then ask questions about this topic so when i learn from this content i engaged i i need to click buttons i need to 
interact with this content and it's it's even more that we are working on and like really how people create learning content is like it's it's going to be changing a lot and it's just yeah. going to have it's just going to be much more fun to to learn something in the future well and i think of a i think of an example of how this has happened in I mean, I've worked in a lot of different organizations and I've <laughs> supported a lot of different organizations over the years. And I there's one in particular where I remember, and again, for its time, it was a great solution and it solved a big problem, which was they had a, a platform that they would have subject matter experts take any of their really like big knowledgeable presentations, you know, where they would do subject matter expertise stuff and they would go into like a Zoom or something like that. And then it would be like, just record yourself giving this presentation and it'll automatically get uploaded and added to the archive of things. And believe it or not, people actually would go into these. But I remember the first time I went in and experienced this thing and I'm like, there are thousands of hours of literally just painful, painful PowerPoint presentations being delivered. And that was the solution. And it's like, if you were a new employee and it's like, oh, you're trying to figure out how to do this here, go subject yourself to what to me is like prisoner of war tactics. Like, I feel like this is something you would do to try and get secret information out of people. Be like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put you in our knowledge base and we're going to make you watch these PowerPoints <laughs> until you tell us until you tell us what we want to know. And it would probably work. But I think to your point, what we can do with this is say, well, why does that have to be the experience that people have to suffer through to be able to find and get the information that they need and get it in a way that's actually consumable and more digestible? Exactly. Yeah. And um, even further, like what we are working on is basically uh, real-time avatars. So uh, using the combination of large language models like OpenAI, GPT, and avatars, you can basically create uh, lessons or you can create uh, communications with avatars. So it's like the next level of like how people can learn. Yeah. So for now, they, they watch video, they click buttons, but uh, for some topics, for example, sales training, yeah, they need real real interactions with somebody real conversations and this is something that also can be like for example there is a teacher who really good at his like sales training yeah but he cannot talk to anyone yeah he, he cannot uh and um, teach yeah, he's like, not on there's not like the bat signal that signals this person to just jump on a call with whoever needs him on a moment's notice exactly so he can use now ai to basically transfer his knowledge in the way that he like into like much much more people because he just basically can clone and use ai to basically do the job for him while he can focus on something else well and what's interesting about that is at the beginning of this year and again this is getting into some what may feel like trippy stuff for people and i get it it can feel a little trippy but i talked about this at the beginning of this year that where i see generative ai going and some of these capabilities is we are going to move into the age where we move beyond passive consumption and things are really, the expectation becomes things are more interactive and it's more of an active experience. So to your point, you know, kind of this next generation is, well, we've moved from, oh, we have this PowerPoint with this painful voice with this person who's just going through this stuff. Now AI is making it so that we can improve it. It's more engaging. It's more valuable. Like it's a little easier to consume to really what you're talking about, the next generation is why would you have to sit and watch a static video that someone else assumed you needed all that information when you could build that knowledge set into an AI model that you then interact with in real time that maybe is giving information, but you actually have the ability to ask follow-up questions or whatever in a sense where it doesn't have to be limited to a live human interaction. Exactly. Yeah, I think we we really moving forward into that world when we're gonna talk to avatars and like ask them questions, or avatars will ask questions, uh, ask us questions, and like assess us. So it's it's a really lots of thing that's gonna change uh, for the next I don't know five ten years. So 
we we, we turn it into something really new and, and fun and uh, yeah really looking well, forward and, and happy to be in like in the in the pioneering of all this all the things well yeah because you're right on the brink of this and i think it's one of those things where that's where i was curious you know like you said it's the technology is not quite there yet in terms of its scalability to do that kind of stuff, um, at least not at the dynamic level that we're seeing. Now, I, I know I've been following this like agents. I'll talk about it this Friday. You know, we are seeing more like AI agents capabilities being spun up where we can say, hey, you know, we could train an AI agent to have the capability of, you know, this to be able to, like we described, answer questions, support people, have a, a specifically trained knowledge set. And then I'm, I'm curious what your prediction is. How close are we to that kind of capability flew, you know, flowing its way into kind of interactive content like that? I think the technology is, is faster than the ability of the markets to adopt it. So, okay. for example, if you're talking about uh, LLMs or even like the next phase is like voice conversation, um, it's all there, yeah. Like the voice cloning is, is pretty good so far. Um, avatars, like real time avatars. It's it's like pretty much in, in two years, we're gonna have all technology possibilities ready. Uh, okay. But uh, the market adoption and like more specific products for specific markets, this is something that will take time. So, because you, what we faced in Eli is that like when you, trying to adopt the technology to specific problem it it really it, it's absolutely different way yeah so it's not something that you have the technology but it's more like try to penetrate because in the companies there are many people working and all they think different ways and uh, even now lots of people they're not like ready to adopt uh, ai avatars yeah because it's yeah. like super new thing but uh, in terms of how it really helps and how it changed, how people are like pr producing this content. And of course, like the content itself, it becomes much more engaging and fun. And someday they will adopt it because otherwise new employees will come. You're not going to gonna have say, a choice. Yeah. Why don't yeah. you still use it? Like everybody's unit this, like it's, it's a new stuff. You need to use it because it's just like, it makes people life easier. Well, and I think I think your point is spot on in terms of kind of there's a big difference between technology capability and then market adoption. Yeah. And I think that is, you know, what we're I mean, I, again, we described it earlier where we're still in this stage where people are even a little unsettled about like, well, how much AI should we really be using? And where do we draw that line between when we have humans in the loop? And when we think about educational content, I mean, I just even think about the example of you know, what we've described in terms of current state, that's still a pretty safe environment to be using AI to generate educational content where you can say, hey, like there's still a human involved in kind of the creating the content. There's still a human involved in shaping which models or which avatars you're using and how you want it to work type of a thing. When you start moving to autonomous agents, it does start to shift things a little bit, even from an educational content, because it's like, well, what if somebody asks these kinds of questions? Or what if they want to know this kind of information? How far do we want to let autonomous AI just go before we go, you know what, that line of questioning is more advanced and we're comfortable uh, with you uh, getting from an interactive video? Yeah, I think it, it's it's not it's just the change in how like you communicate with with information. Yeah, like the way how right. you actually can have this information, but still there is a human who control what this agent can know and like how exactly this agent should behave and like what should he say. Yeah, so uh, I don't see any any risk here because it's always the creator and the company and the owners who actually are controlling what ai can do like in our case what content is in the video in in agent case what is in this in database that's actually agented operating with so it's all can be controlled by a human and uh, ai doesn't have any conscious or like ability to think it just like do what their creators want them to do and that's it yeah. so it's all fully controllable and uh, 
just resolving the problems that uh, owner and creator of this uh, model want to resolve. So I'm actually curious, and for those of you who are watching or listening, feel free to comment in because I'm actually your curious, you know, t- curious your take on this. But on your end, Alex, how where are you seeing folks on the adoption curve when it comes to things like AI for voice, AI for video? You know, are, are people in kind of this still? Are you are you still dealing a lot with like early adopters who maybe see like, yeah, of course we're going to do this. This is naturally where we go. Is kind of the middle starting to move more towards this? Like, yeah, we use it pretty regularly. Where are we on the adoption curve? And for those of you listening or watching, I'm actually curious, you know, how many of you might be using AI tools to actually create? And again, I, I don't think just like the written content, but the the voice, the video content. I, uh, I think it's, it's pretty early yet in terms of like the okay. usage. So we had this super huge hype uh, at the beginning of the last year in 2023 in January when like first this uh, chat GPT came up and this is something that really give the boost. But after that, we've seen that people still couldn't understand how properly use this technology yet. And now okay. it's a time when the hype is already down. So basically now we see that people who stay and still use it, they use it to really resolve problems. And now it's just going to okay. start organically grow and okay. be used by, by many, people, many people. Of course, and I have a friend who actually creates movies using AI, and this is his full-time job. <laughs> Uh, really? We are AI company who is like all about AI. So of course- Oh yeah, for sure. It's like it's, it's something that we live in, but there are tons of people who even don't know what, what's going on and they never heard about it. And uh, yeah. for them, we need like a couple years at least to this technology to be somehow used by them yeah, in some way. Okay. As no, that's super helpful because just- um, Yeah, yeah, or something. <laughs> Okay. Well, and I think that's helpful because I, I definitely think we saw the major AI hype cycle, you know, coming into out of 2022 into 2023. It was just like everything, everybody thought yeah, everything yeah. was going to be AI. And, and then a lot of it died down because there was a lot of junk. I mean, there honestly was, there was a ton of like, we could do AI for this. And you're like, why, why would you, yeah, it's a hype. Like, it didn't it's even a... make sense. Yeah. And so now we've kind of crashed out of that. And to your point, though, I think we'll slowly start to see the adoption. And I know, you know, even just from my own personal experience, it's one of those things, again, going back at some of the concerns or hesitations people have, the people I know who have adopted this, and even myself as a creator, I actually find AI helps me be more creative and do more things than I was in the past. It's not like it's it's pulling away from what I was doing. It actually, I mean, that's just been my experience where I'm like, oh, before I wasn't able to do this, now I can because the technology is capable of doing it. And yes. I think the same is true with like AI video and voice where it's like, well, before you wouldn't have even had the time or the energy or the capability to do it. Now you can actually exercise your creativity in new and different ways. Exactly. And it's the same way adopting in everything. And in our case, we don't actually, our clients, they don't came to us from the, when they created real videos. In our case, uh, most of our clients did PPT presentations before. So it's not about like replacing, it's just like bringing new things into their environment, yep. into how they create content. Because yeah. uh, those who like spend tons of money on video creation, and, and it means that it works for them. They they wanted that and uh, they might not want to change it now. But again, who knows, like in the, uh, if they see the benefit of like turning and using more AI, why not? I mean, it's, it's, it's all going to be in the future. Well, and I use this analogy a lot. I think it goes back to, you know, sometimes we can fall into this false mindset that like the box is only this big. And so if AI takes up part of the box, there's less. When actually AI just, we're kind of in this constantly expanding box and it's like, well, all we're doing is creating more space to be able to exercise new and different things to your point, whether it's you used to do PowerPoints and now you can create interactive video to, even if you're in a high production movie scene, it might be like, yeah, but before we used to have to pay or we didn't have the budget to do some of these stunts or this other stuff. It's like, well, now we can just do it all in CGI and it allows us to just do more with our creativity. Exactly.
Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, Alex, this has been super fun and we are right at time. So I want to be sensitive to that, but this has been really insightful and helpful. I hope it encourages people to at least experiment and toy around with some of this stuff because the technology is there and it is extremely powerful with what you can do. And um, so I appreciate you unpacking it with me and just helping people better understand what's possible. So thanks for making the time. Yeah, thank you. It was, was great to chat and uh, discuss about future of of ourselves. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody for watching, listening. Uh, if you didn't catch the whole thing, the live replay will be on all the uh, usual channels after this. And also, if you aren't subscribed to my Substack, make sure you are because you'll get the Cliff Notes version of some of my biggest reflections uh, a couple days after the stream. So we will talk to you all later and see you next week.